Good morning to all of you and welcome to another day of the Keck Summer School on Human Rights. This morning we will deal with guidance for law enforcement on places of worship. I am Joran Gunnar, a member of the Keck Thematic Group on Human Rights, where I represent Keck member churches in Sweden. Before we start the actual seminar, we will have a morning prayer. So I will give the floor to the very right Archimedrite Aemilianos, who will lead us in prayer. And later on, he'll also be a speaker on the panel. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning to all. Um, let me start with a few words of prayer for all of us. Blessed is our God, always now and forever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to you, O God. Glory to you. Heavenly King, comfort of the spirit of truth, who are present everywhere and fill all things. Treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us, cleanse us of every stain and save our souls, gracious Lord. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your great love. We pray to you, hear us and have mercy. Again, we pray for mercy, life, peace, health, salvation, visitation, forgiveness and remission of the sins of the servants of God. All pious faithful, those who reside and visit this city and all of the participants of this webinar. Again, we pray for the servants of God, all those virtually gathered here today and for their families. For you are a merciful and loving God, and to you we give glory, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Lord our God, who are rich in mercy and with a careful wisdom direct our lives, listen to our prayer. Receive our repentance for our sins. Bring an end to this new infectious disease, this new epidemic, just as you averted the punishment of your people in the time of David the king. You who are the physician of our souls and bodies, grant restored health to those who have been seized by this illness, raising them from their bed of suffering so that they might glorify you, O merciful Savior, and preserve in health those who have not been infected. By your grace, Lord, bless, strengthen, and preserve all those who, out of love and sacrifice, care for the sick, either in their homes or in the hospitals. Remove all sickness and suffering from your people and teach us to value life and health as gifts from you. Give us your peace, O oh God, and fill our hearts with unflinching faith in your protection. Hope in your help and love for you and our neighbor. For yours is, it is to have mercy on us and save us, O oh our God. And to you we ascribe glory, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Good morning to all of you, and may we have a blessed session. Thank you. Thank you, Father. So we are starting our session. Keck is together with other European religious organizations in partnership in the project Safer and Stronger Communities in Europe. As part of the project, the consortium has produced a guide for law enforcement. The aim is to improve religious literacy. Religious literacy is a key for creating safer environments for places of worship and cemeteries. Years ago, I was part of a Swedish interface group, and one issue was how educational material presented religions. The Jewish representative told a lot of misconceptions about Judaism, the same for the Muslim participant, and then the Baptist told it's the same about baptism phase. After contact with the publishers of educational textbooks, they decided to involve religious representations in the pre-reading of the textbook for a better understanding of religions. Now, Keck and partners have prepared material for a better understanding of religions, a material for prosecutors, police, judges, etc., in the area of worship places and religious rituals. This is, of course, of utmost importance that the authorities do have correct information. And in this section, session, representatives of the consortium members will present each their part of the project and explains why this guide is important. 
Before I introduce our first speaker, I will mention that questions can be placed all the time to <clears throat> the panelists, and we will save them until after all presentations are done. And you do it in the chat, and I will repeat your questions later on. So please use the chat. So our first speaker representing Judaism is Ofi Rivash. He is the CEIO of Security and Crisis Center, a part of the European Jewish Congress. The organization coordinates security policies in the European Jewish communities. He's a very important voice in the European setting when it comes to the security of the Jewish communities in Europe and extended to all religious communities in Europe. So, welcome to our seminar, and the floor is yours, please. Thanks, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Goran. And uh, I would like to thank again all the participants for uh, joining us uh, uh, this uh, day. Uh, it's uh, for me, as a uh, uh, Jewish, uh, it's, it's a big honor to participate in this uh, webinar. I'm really uh, excited and very happy to be part of this uh, program. And I would like to thank also uh, Vanessa and Elisabeth for first for preparing the, the, uh, the summer school and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, to be our partner in a beautiful and amazing project uh, uh, in Saski. It, it's amazing and uh, really a, a beautiful uh, project. And I'm sure this uh, project will improve uh, definitely uh, the security in and outside the places of uh, of uh, worship. So thanks again to to all of you. I would like to start uh, to start that uh, to mention that since uh, 2015 uh, we can see a big uh, dramatically change uh, in the threat and in the security in especially in uh, all over the world but i would, would focus on uh, on uh, europe uh, the first change we saw that nearly uh, all uh, uh, the attackers uh, were uh, local uh, citizen uh, uh, before we saw that the, the enemy or the attacker used to come from another uh, continent or but now they are, most of them are uh, local Second thing, uh, if before uh, the attack was against specific uh, targets, now we can see, the, since 2015, we can see uh, a lot of attack, uh, nearly all of them, in, against a soft target. When I'm saying a soft target, I mean a place of worships and, of course, a public, uh, a public uh, place. We could see also, uh, uh, and we can see it also until now, people are using a religious uh, motive, either it's a cloth or either it's other symbol like a cross or like Magen David or like other thing. Also, they are, uh, they are, they are attacked. Uh, also, they, uh, they are attacked. So the attack is not only against the building. We see also a lot of attack against uh, people and, uh, and everywhere. Another change, another change that we understood that, that happened also uh, uh, following the, the, the change, it's the, the, the important to have a good a collaboration and to work together with the law enforcement. When I'm saying law enforcement is like Dr. Goran mentioned before, it's a police, intelligence, a, a prosecutor, judges, etc. To understand, first of all, to understand a, a better the threat, to understand better our uh, as communities to understand better our uh, uh, needs and to see how we can, first of all, how we can have a support as a minority, as how we can have a support, as also our budget is very uh, limited, that we need also a, a found, a, a found a support. And, and this, and we saw also that we start to make also, uh, uh, since uh, this time we start, the police understood the needs, they understood, they understand our challenge. And then we start to see a lot of uh, conferences together between the Jewish uh, community, between the security department and the police, uh, the police uh, force. So we could see in the last year, either it's a seminar 
או קונפרנסס, או טרנינג, או other, 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 other things. I can tell you that before 2015, it was very, very rare to see this cooperation or trust between the, the community and the law, the law enforcement. And then when we start, uh, when we start the, the, the cooperation with the authority, uh, the first thing we understood that, uh, that both, of us, both of us understood, the law enforcement and the Jewish communities, we understood there's a huge gap. And the law enforcement and people who are coming to protect our building or prosecute who are coming uh, to decide that if the event is, if the crime is anti-Semitism or it's only normal, uh, normal crime, and where is the limit between a uh, normal crime when to anti-Semitism or when a prosecutor can call, why he cannot call uh, to our member uh, to come to be a witness on, uh, on Shabbat, in the, on Shabbat, or why they cannot come on Yom Kippur or in the holiday, then we understood that there's a huge uh, gap. And, uh, also, and then we thought that it's very important to help them uh, to help to help the law for to help them to understand better our needs. Uh, we prepared a, a guide that this guide, like a doctor Goran said before, it's a one guide for all the four uh, fed organizations. It's in the, it's the first, it's the, it's in the, the, there's the four part in the guide for the Muslim community, for the, uh, for Kek, uh, for the Buddhist and for the Jewish community. There's the four uh, part like that. It's uh, going to be first for the law enforcement. This is the, the objective of the guy is, is, uh, is uh, uh, first is to see how we can, how the police, how the authority can understand us uh, better, can increase the awareness in uh, our uh, building, but not only against our building, also I guess also uh, to increase the, the, the understanding against our community leaders and also against the, the, the community uh, member uh, to build the trust uh, and cooperation between a civil society and the national uh, authorities. I think this is something that it's uh, crucial that, uh, that uh, and we're going to talk about it later today afternoon in the other session about the, the role of the community members today and how they must also uh, change the behavior and to, and to be uh, much more cooperative and much more uh, understand the, the threat and to see how they can help our uh, organization, but to understand also, also they can help the, the authorities. And of course, the, to understand better the, the communication. The communication, uh, between our leadership, our, our community member, and, uh, and uh, the authority. Vanessa, please, the slide. So uh, I'm going to speak about our uh, part, our uh, part in the guides, the Jewish part in the, the guides. Of course, after my colleagues uh, will present the other uh, parts, the other uh, religions. Uh, uh, so first, uh, the, the, uh, like you can see, there's a lot of uh, topics. It's a religious topic, uh, 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 anti-Semitism and other things. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, so the first part is the Jewish religious. Uh, uh, this is the first uh, part. After the, the Judaism in Europe, a little bit about the history of the Judaism in uh, Europe when the people uh, came, uh, where they, they are sitting, where they are sitting, uh, the number of the people in the communities, then explain uh, to explain them about uh, the synagogue. What is the synagogue? Uh, why is it important for the Jewish people the, the synagogue? And then uh, the main holidays. We have the list of the main holidays. It's very important for them first of all to understand when is the main, when is the holidays. So they must increase the the threat is uh, of course is much higher. So they need to increase the security uh, during this uh, period, but also to understand uh, why people suddenly more people are coming to the building, why people are dressing uh, differently when they're coming to the building, why people are not coming with the car in the in the holidays, and and, and thing and another thing, and of course all that is first of all is to understand better our challenge, to understand better our uh, role or our uh, tradition 
in our holiday, a second to see how they can have a better uh, uh, cooperation. Like I mentioned before, cooperation with all kinds of authority. So the, the idea is to give the guide uh, to all the to all the uh, to all the uh, uh, to all the, the all the kind of uh, law enforcement to prosecute or judge, etc. Uh, to explain them what is anti-Semitism, uh, and this, a little bit a statistic of anti-Semitism, a little bit a, a few examples of anti-Semitism, and the most important thing, the number for us, the number, and what is the difference, uh, and from where it's a, it's a, it's start to be a normal criminal, and it start to be uh, anti-Semitism uh, uh, violent. And I can tell you from our, my experience that the, many times the police and the prosecutor and the judges, they don't understand why uh, if somebody is beating a, a, a Jewish guy because he uh, has a kippa in his head, uh, why it's uh, not a criminal and why we are thinking that it's anti-Semitism event, why somebody is throwing a stone in our synagogue, why it's not a normal a normal crime? It's it's anti-Semitism uh, uh, act, and many examples like that that, that uh, to explain and to show them that uh, and to understand better our uh, challenge and uh, and uh, our uh, challenge is like I said before. Uh, I think this is this guide uh, for all of us for all the four uh, for all the four for all the four all the four uh, FET organization. It's a crucial. Uh, uh, to understand, but also it's a crucial for us as a Jewish community or Muslim community or Kek or Udi, to understand what is the challenge of the other uh, of the other faith organization of the other faith religion to understand to understand better. And I believe if all of us uh, uh, will understand better, all of us will respect better the challenge and the, the tradition of the other religions, and they also the authority will do so and the community member will do so. I think we can uh, create a better society, much better society. We can create better, uh, uh, better uh, security for all of us and better cooperation uh, for law enforcement uh, between the law enforcement and our community leader, community members, uh, etc. Uh, just I forgot to mention that the, the guide uh, will, uh, uh, we, we translate the guide, I think, in eight uh, language, like that is going to be easier, uh, easier for the for the people to give it and to share it with the local uh, authority. Thank you very much, and I'm waiting for a question. If you have, I hope you have, and uh, and uh, good luck for all of us in this amazing uh, conference. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ophir, for your presentation. I, as a member of the thematic group on human rights, I just want to say that we appreciate very much the partnership together with other faith groups in this important project. And thank you, Ophir, for remembering us about the situation the Jewish communities in Europe are facing with local attackers, with buildings targeted, with people targeted. And of course, we need to join hand in telling it's unacceptable with the harassment and the attacks. And even to keep a kippah on your head can cause harassment. Of course, we need to react. And it's important then to show the authorities what it is about. And thank you for giving us an overview about the objectives of this guide we are talking about. And if you have questions about the guide and the Jewish part, please write in the chat and we will take it up later on. So I will please write them in the chat. And now we will continue with the Buddhist perspective. And uh, we have Stefano Davide Beretta with us. He is a writer, journalist, scholar, regular contributor to the monthly Yoga Journal Italy and director of the quarterly Buddhism magazine. He is the vice president of the European Buddhist Union and on the board of the Italian Buddhist Union.
He has published several books related to Buddhist issues like Embrace of the World, uh, The Western Way to Meditation, and Happy as a Buddha. So now I am happy to leave the floor to Stefano, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be with all of you. And thank you for to the organizer to make it, make it possible. And um, uh, uh, the colleagues that uh, has come before me already said uh, a lot about the Saskia project and a, a lot of the about the reason why the European Buddhist Union decided to be part of this important project. But I would like to start um, uh, talking a little bit about what Buddhism is today in Europe and why it's important to be part of this project. Because uh, maybe a question arises and the question is what Buddhist has to do with the topic of security, because many people see Buddhism as um, a phenomenon related to just meditation or inner peace or uh, uh, something that involves people who really want only to stay on the cu on the cushion and to meditate and to have a spiritual uh, experience. And that's true in a way. But the point is that there is no spirituality without engagement in society. And um, you can understand it very easily uh, if you think about the two souls of Buddhism in Europe. Um, let's start with a little bit of history. Uh, Buddhism came to Europe and to the West mainly 100 years ago. So it's a very new phenomenon. Um, Today, the most of the Buddhists in Europe are mainly middle class people, uh, white people, and uh, middle age. And, and this says a lot about what Buddhism is and how it is um, related to the topic of the human rights, because these kind of people are also uh, uh, very much interested in how Buddhism can make life better and how uh, we can have a better connection with the other people and with the society. Uh, but it changes very much if we look at the Asian communities. Uh, we have a lot of Asian, uh, when, I, when I say Asian communities, I talk about people who are born in Asia or people who are born in Europe, in Italy, in France, in England or whatever, uh, who, are, who are now completely European, but have uh, Asian roots. They speak another language, they have an, another Latin, a native language, they have another uh, native culture, and they are, in a way, closed communities. Uh, uh, in a way, they are a different, a different context, a different world uh, from the European Middle Buddhist. And it's very interesting, interesting because they are mainly the people who suffer uh, more for discrimination, for uh, vandalism, for attacks in their, own, in their own communities. In the last three years, we had um, three very important episodes of discrimination in Finland, for example, in Sweden, in Berlin, where two centers and one temple were attacked by uh, people. We, we really don't know who, who, who they are, but they, they attacked their, their places because some Asian people were praying there, were living there, and were, they, they were uh, expressing their faith and their belonging to the Buddhist communities. And so uh, if it's true that uh, the most of the Buddhist centers in Europe are meditation centers and spiritual centers. It's also true that m many of them are places where the Asian communities gather and where they find a place to uh, re rediscover their own culture and their own uh, entity. Uh, 
And so the point is uh, what the EBU and uh, the National Buddhist Union does uh, and what we, we try to do. Uh, we have a, a role in the European societies, a role of connection between the European institution and uh, the society and the Buddhist centers. We are a sort of umbrella organization that gathers national unions. I mean, the union, the, the Buddhist unions, like the Italian one, the French one, the German one, that includes centers, temples, and members around the countries. We have uh, also organization, inter-European organization in our, in our union, and we have a lot of uh, single centers and temples and members uh, in our countries that uh, are part of, of the European Buddhist Union. We gather more than 50 members around across Europe, from the east to the west, from the north to the south, including UK and Greece, for example. And uh, what we try to do mainly is to spread Buddhist values and Buddhist, uh, I mean, uh, Buddhist ideas into society. And two of them are really very important, in my opinion, and very useful to the project that we are trying to uh, carry on together. One is the idea of compassion that is central to the Buddha, in the Buddhist philosophy, and the other one is the idea of interdependence. Those two, uh, let's say, those two topics, those two main main ideas are what move us in uh, for our engagement in in the European society and in this project. We are very, very proud to be part of this of this project because we think that it's a very good place where we can pull, spread, and make real these two Buddhist ideas. Uh, another thing we do, of course, is uh, working with the local institution and with the uh, local authorities in order to prevent any kind of discrimination and any kind of uh, non-respect of, of the human rights. What we do is to, um, we are, let's say, involved in, in the education field. We work with children and with young people in order to make them aware what is about to be part of the community, to be part not only of the Buddhist community, but to be part of the, so, uh, of the social community. And uh, another thing that we are involved in is um, information and communication. Um, of course, our experience in, 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 let's say, fortunately and unfortunately, it, at the same time, uh, our experience about the discrimination is not comparable to the one that the Jewish communities or, for example, the Muslim communities have. But I'm very... Uh, uh, I know that in the next future, uh, the problem will be our problem too. If you see what is happening, for example, in Myanmar, uh, the fight again between the Buddhist communities and the, the Islamic communities or the Rohingyas, for example, is creating a lot of problems, not only in Myanmar, but also inside the Buddhist communities of Europe. And uh, the main question that we have is if our members are really aware of the problem uh, and if they are really aware of what is going to happen, not just in the Asian countries, but also in Europe. So our aim is to work uh, on this awareness in order to make, to spread more awareness about the problem, about the instruments we have to face it, about creating a culture of not only awakening, that it's a typical Buddhist jargon, but also a, a, a culture of more social engagement, a, more, a, a culture of compassion, a culture of dialogue and uh, connection with other people, with other faith, with other religion, of course, but only uh, also with the institution. So what we are trying to do and what we will do into this project, it, it's, it's uh, willing to be um, a sort of 
connectors between people who really are not still uh, aware of what is happening and trying to bring them more instruments, more awareness and more uh, like, yes, instruments for becoming a better, uh, to, to create a better society. Uh, Buddhism has to do a lot with the idea of creating uh, uh, an, an, an awakening society. I think this Sasuke project, it's a very good opportunity to do it. And we are very, very happy to do it together with our religions. I think we have a lot to learn from our partners. We have a lot to learn from the experience of the other, other religions. But since interdependence, as I already said, it's one of our values, we will do it uh, for the next future and we will do it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm coming in with the camera in a second. Thank you once again. And thank you for reminding us that even if we are basically talking about Europe, we are connected to the entire world. And what happens in other parts of the world may also affect us in Europe. And that goes for all our communities, for sure. And thank you for placing Buddhism inside this project and making it clear for us. And it's important for all of us to see that harassment and discrimination may look different in different communities, but it's always needed to be handled in a proper way in relation to authorities and in relation to the surrounding society. And that also remember us that this project may also help other faith communities not involved in the project, since they will also suffer of all these aspects of discrimination, harassment, and abuse of human rights. So thank you very much. And I still remind you to put questions inside the chat box for later on. Thank you. So yeah. our fourth panelist is for the Christian part of it. And for that will be Emilianos Bugiano. His title is Very Right Argument Right. He was ordained deacon in the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople in 2009, ordained Four. a priest in Paris later on. Sorry? 2004. 2015? Okay. 2004. 2000, sorry, 2004. 2015, he I hope that's correct. He became the director of the Office of the Orthodox Church in the European Union in Brussels. He has represented the Ecumenical Patriarchate on many occasions and various conferences. And I'm sorry for doing a mistake with my friend here. And I need to say that I appreciate Father Aimelianus a lot from our co-work in the thematic group of Keck on Human Rights, which we both belong and regularly meet each other. At the corona situation, it's on internet, but otherwise we even can meet face to face. But this time you will speak about the Christian perspective, so I give the floor to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Joran. Uh, good morning again to all of you. Uh, my approach to this issue will be from a different perspective, I think. Well, the Saska project, namely the guidelines of law enforcement, uh, which have been required and funded by the European Union, has been put together in an effort to improve religious literacy for prosecutors, police, judges, etc., as it has been mentioned already. Before I say anything more particular about the portion regarding Christianity in the Saskia project, I would like to underline that this may sound elementary to many, if not to all of you, but please keep in mind that the whole purpose of this project is to inform, educate, and make those responsible able to deal with security issues that arise when dealing with crime-related crime activities against churches at large. I would like to underline the importance that this part is not based on a denominational approach, nor is it based on syncretism, but from a fraternal point of view of the Christian tradition of almost 2000 years. 
This is part of the work of our thematic group on human rights, and it is Keck's contribution to the Consortium on Religious Literacy of Law Enforcement. And uh, just to make sure I'm not the author of the text. I would like, before I start, just to make a few points on what has already been uh, presented, and I thank uh, the other in, uh, participants who have spoken about it. I would like to highlight the fact of the importance of religious education, as mentioned by Iman, and um, keeping in mind this aspect of um, cooperation and staying strong united that has been mentioned also yesterday by His Eminence Metropolitan Nikitas. I'd like to refer to the Brussels Declaration of 2001 that was produced from an interreligious meeting at the invitation of His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, and His Excellency Romano Prodi, the then President of the European Commission. It sums up basically that every crime committed in the name of religion is a crime against religion, which is a reaffirmation of the 1992 Berne Declaration and the 1994 Bosphorus Declaration. Human rights should be and should remain the base of the Saska project because uh, we do not live any longer in our own little bubbles where we remain with uh, like-minded people and people who share our own convictions. Diversity is what makes us great. Diversity is what enriches us. And only by learning about others will we be able to fulfill our role to reach towards heaven. Anthropos in Greek means exactly that, anothrosko. I try to reach towards the heavens. And we should not just stay grounded and looking at what is under our feet. So um, <clears throat> Christianity is a monotheistic religion based on the teachings, life and person of Jesus Christ. The word Christian itself designates the followers of Christ and has been first, it has appeared first in the city of Antioch. They generally confess Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ, as the Messiah, God and Savior of the world. Most Christians believe in the triune God, the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And today more than a third of the world's population is Christian. The specific Christian institution is the church, while the most important symbol is the cross. And the normative text for all Christians is the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. The main Christian tradition uh, today is the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Churches, and the Anglican Church. And uh, I'm being very general about it without going into different and more detailed information. Christianity in Europe appears with St. Paul. The first Christian communities were founded by Jesus' disciples in the first century. It isn't until 313 with the famous Edict of Milan, to which I referred to yesterday, to those who were present, if you remember. After three centuries of persecutions, Christians are finally given the liberty to practice their religion. Things will change quickly, and in 380, with Emperor Theodosius the first, Christianity becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire. In the 11th century, Western and Eastern Christianity will get separated, while in the 16th century, Protestant Reformation divides Western Europe between Catholics and Protestants. In Europe, Christianity has had a strong impact on all aspects of social life, including the political and social order, economic, science, arts, education, social welfare, and healthcare. The churches have organized and continue to organize schools, universities, hospitals, care homes for those in need, orphanages, national and international humanitarian organizations, and are today one of the most important non-governmental providers of social services, education and healthcare in the world, without being in any way, shape or form discriminative about who they provide care for. Despite a decline in religious practice in Europe, Christianity remains not only historical, but also a social and cultural focal point. More than 73% of the EU citizens declare themselves to be Christians. In general, the northern countries have a significant Protestant presence. Predominantly Orthodox countries are located in Eastern and Southern Europe. 
significant Protestant or Orthodox minorities exist today throughout Europe with either historical or more recent origins due to migration. When speaking about the word church, ecclesia, it's a Greek word and it means this perpetual invitation to come and join in worship. Three main points can be made. When we speak of ecclesia, of church, we can either refer to the place of worship, the general sense of the community of believers, or a juridical sense, the organization of the church on a local, regional, or universal level. The place of worship becomes a sacred place for the Christian traditions. It's a sacramental space where one can encounter God and where God gives himself directly to humans through the grace of the holy mysteries like baptism, Eucharist, etc. The structure of a traditional church includes meeting spaces, congregational spaces, the sanctuary situated in the continuation of the congregational space, and it's usually reserved for ministers and it's part of the church where sacraments are celebrated. The altar, the sanctuary, is most important and the holiest area in a church. It's separated from the rest of the church, depending on the different traditions, either by an elevated portion of the ground or a separating structure, or even an iconostasis in the Orthodox case. At the center of the altar is a table called the altar table on which the Eucharist, the communion, is celebrated. In Christian tradition, Sunday is the day of the resurrection and it is the day which is offered and concentrates on the worship of God. On Sundays, Christians gather together in the church to listen to the word of God, to thank and praise him through chants and religious hymns. And it's a day of joy, increased communion with God in prayer and with one's neighbor through communion and alms. And it is also a day of weekly rest for most Christians. This guide, when we put it together, served and serves and will serve, hopefully, as a means of better understanding those differences that will be important for the authorities to be able to provide the security that is so much needed. You know, it is becoming more and more obvious that it is not just um, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia that we have to deal with today. More and more Christianophobia and uh, acts of uh, vandalism and hatred are performed within Europe. And um, it has become a great issue that needs to be addressed. Main holidays as Christmas or Easter are the days where the police, in many cases, especially so in France, will be present around the big cathedrals. Feasts like Ascension or the Pentecost or even the Assumption which are holidays common for all denominations, not so much the Assumption or Domission of the Holy Virgin, but at least the rest, are the times in which churches will be full and need for security during those times is essential. How can this be obtained? It's all about the cooperation with authorities. There are several practical security aspects of that law enforcement officials should be aware of in order to better protect and improve cooperation with Christian communities. Liaison with the community, and uh, this is uh, the basic one, I think, uh, for all of those, no matter which religion or denomination we are talking about, we know that it is vital to have local authorities that can be contacted directly. We have to cultivate and improve and create, in some cases, unfortunately, uh, a contact with those who will be able to provide this security. For the majority of the religions, uh, there are people responsible for religious affairs uh, that are in contact with the representatives. And they should consult with representatives of religious communities regarding the needs 
especially for the organization of major religious feasts, which are common in all religions, may it be Islam or Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism or whichever religion there is. Now, inside the places of worship, yesterday we heard that the cases, for example, in Sweden, they were divided into two categories. The one where we had vandalism and destruction or theft of religious objects. And uh, one does not need to look only at Sweden. We can see that this is a common event and a common uh, problem where people will enter churches to steal either holy objects or icons or even material, as has been the case mentioned yesterday. For us, it is important to underline the importance that certain objects have within the church. Crucifixes, icons, statues and other sacred objects have to be treated with utmost respect, especially the objects present inside the space of the sanctuary. Nothing on the altar table can be touched except by the ministers of the church. In the Catholic and Orthodox tradition, the altar table itself, or within its immediate vicinity, holds the tabernacle, which is a locked box in which the consecrated Eucharist or hosts are stored for future distribution during certain religious services or to bring to those who are sick and in need in hospitals. In the Orthodox Church, the altar also holds the gospel with a piece of cloth called the Antimension, on which the Eucharist is celebrated and in which small pieces of holy relics are inserted. So you can imagine right away how everything changes from just being an object to becoming something sacred. And I would like also to clarify that there is this notion that in the Orthodox Church, women are not allowed in the sanctuary and no, 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 that's not the case. Nobody who has not the blessing can enter into the sanctuary. It doesn't matter if you're a man, it does not allow you to enter. I personally have kicked out people from the altar when they would come in and say, I said, what are you doing here? You have no place. This is a holy place. This is a sacred place. And it is not an act of discrimination. It is just the notion of holy and sacred as it is perceived within the Christian tradition. Let's look at anti-Christian activity. Christianity, being the world's largest religion, is also one of the world's most oppressed faith communities. On a global scale, Asia and Africa are the continents where Christians are most discriminated against and persecuted. In some countries, the authorities are the main perpetrators, while in others there are social, religious and extremist groups which commit crimes against Christians. These crimes include defamation, verbal harassment, threats, hate speech, humiliation, inhuman treatment and murders, violations of freedom of expression, discrimination and hostility against Christian congregations, violations of the right of freedom of assembly, acts of vandalism and discretion of places of worship at sacred places. We heard examples yesterday again, and that's why it is important to have also uh, sessions that describe particular cases so that we have a better understanding. Many acts of violence toward Christian sites are carried out each year in Europe. And most commonly, there are cases of vandalism, robbery, profanation, arson or destruction of churches, schools. And one that really hurts me personally as a human being, but which is also common for many, for the rest of other religions, is when people attack cemeteries and desecrate monuments. In Europe, all Christian denominations are targeted without exceptions. There is nobody who could say, oh, you know, this is only a case that goes there or it applies to that. No, as it has been offered and mentioned by my previous uh, speakers, we share this notion of holiness and sacredness, no matter which religion we represent. And I cannot stay with my mouth and my ears and my eyes closed when I see such abhorrent acts being perpetrated. On others. There are resolutions of the Parliamentary Assembly in the Council of Europe, Resolution 2036, for example, of the 29th of January 2015, 
entitled Tackling Intolerance and Discrimination in Europe with a Special Focus on Christians. It underscores that intolerance and discrimination on grounds of religion or belief affect minority religious groups in Europe, but also people belonging to majority religious groups. Numerous acts of hostility, violence and vandalism have been recorded in recent years against Christians and their places of worship, but these acts are often overlooked by the national authorities. And this is where this project comes in. This is where this project is important because we are called to make it known. I'm sure you all know that in every country, the religious authorities do contact the authorities, the governmental authorities. But does it go anywhere? Yesterday we heard about uh, from Reverend Dr. Daniel Topalski about how only congregations of over 200 people have the right to certain security aspects and measures. Saskia Project should focus on providing this for everybody. The reasons behind all these anti-Christian attacks and violent acts are extremely varied. Some of them do are to the condition of mentally unbalanced persons. Others can be attributed to larceny because many churches house many churches house pieces of art of valuable items. Targeted also uh, by thieves such as bells or metal objects. At the same time, we can refer to ideological or political motivation when the discretions are aimed directly at the image of the church and what it represents in European society. These acts are claimed by members of anarchist, radical and extreme left or right movements and materialize in desecrations of graffiti on the walls of churches and Christian monuments. Last but not least, anti-Christian violent acts in Europe are also frequently religious motivated. Religious hatred is manifested to desecration of elements of sacred objects belonging to Christians, profanation of Eucharist, crucifixes, icons, but also through violent attacks against Christian persons, churches and monuments. And again, here comes the point where religious education would be a means, at least to begin with, to cultivate from an early age and present to the younger generations what the other religions stand for, who they are, what they are. And by no means, uh, it should not just end by better informing the younger generations. We ourselves need also to be put in this context of being able to learn and understand better the other, our uh, brother and our sister, who might not believe, might not use the same name of God that we use, might not express their faith in practice the way we do, but it does not take away anything from their importance and the role that religion plays in their lives. In the last years, churches have regularly been attacked almost everywhere in Europe, as I said. In general, religious leaders, fully aware of the danger of the instrumentalization of the crimes against Christian places of worship, have called for calm, peace and mutual respect, but also persistently demanded that the churches should be better secured. Don't forget, um, if somebody expresses a concern about an anti-Christian crime, then suddenly we become the target of being um, old-fashioned, of being uh, extremists, of being... Um, we end up not saying anything because otherwise we will be targeted or we will be used and fall into the trap of those who want to use a certain way of speaking and degrading everything and bringing it all onto a level which has nothing to do with the sacred. EU member states and local authorities should be encouraged to step up cooperation and information exchanges, both amongst themselves and through the religious leaders, law enforcement agencies, judicial authorities, and especially so staying in close contact with the representatives of other religions. Because that is the way that we will be able to stand together, stand united and face these challenges, which become more and more a reality, an everyday reality. Let me please close intervention with examples of anti-Christian crimes 
in the last years, in for, on the 14th of February 2015 in Croatia, unknown persons vandalized sanctuary of the Serbian Orthodox Cathedral of St. Nicholas in Karlovac and stole crosses and sacred objects. The same church was desecrated again on the 27th of August 2015. On July 26, 2016, the participants at a Catholic Mass in the church Saint-Étienne de Rivray and Normandie en France were attacked by two terrorists. Six people were taken hostage. One of them, the priest of the community, was killed. On the night of the 21st December 2019, the cemetery next to Saint Jean Baptiste Church in Villeroux in Belgium was desecrated. Tombs were vandalized, several crosses were destroyed. On March 2, 2020, on Lesbos, the island in Greece, which has the greatest production of, of all those who try to save their lives from the situation as we know it. The Orthodox Church of St. George was vandalized. A month later, the Church of St. Catherine suffered the same fate. On the 12th of April 2020, the outside walls of Vejlea Church in Ishoi in Denmark were tagged with anti-Christian inscriptions. On 29 October 2020, three people were killed in a stabbing attack attributed to Islamist terrorism at the Catholic Church Notre Dame de Nice in France. On the 20th and 24th of January 2021, a church in Spangad in Sweden was twice set on fire with Molotov cocktails. On 18th of March 2021, a wooden Orthodox church in Bucharest in Romania was vandalized with graffiti inscriptions. On the 4th of April 2021, Easter Sunday, the church of Eichach in Bavaria, Germany, had its facade tagged with anti-Catholic inscriptions. The list goes on and there is no point in mentioning more. What for me is important and vital in this project is that by sharing the information, by providing those in charge with the necessary knowledge and tools to better react and to honestly take measures, we do ourselves a favor and we offer the opportunity for those who claim ignorance to not be able to claim that any longer in order for them to calm their conscience in these cases. Thank you very much again for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this intervention with us. Thank you for presenting the Christian tradition and the faith and the view on the holy, but also placing Christianity in Europe historically, but also showing that today Christianity in Europe is also under attack in places locally, vandalized churches and so on. Thank you.